What's up, everybody? It is Izzy back again with yet another Q&A. So, today was biceps and back, and with that said, let's get to the first question. This anecdote comes from a guy with the username, Yes, I'm That Guy. And he's very appropriately named, as you'll soon see. His question is, I told a girl she had a massive chest, and she got mad. LOL. Well, like I said, you really are that guy, aren't you? In your head, how did you see that playing out? Because in my head, unless you look like Brad f***ing Pitt or something, that was pretty much the only reaction that you could have possibly gotten. Well done, sir, for making men everywhere look bad. Rock on. The Angles 90 handle here makes it possible to rotate at the wrist a little bit, which improves SFR. If I go to the gym before work, should I eat first or should I focus on hydration? Um, I really don't see those things as mutually exclusive. You should definitely focus on hydration, but if your choice, for example, is like getting a little bit more sleep or getting up to make breakfast and then eating breakfast, I would choose the sleep and I would just use supplements. Uh, this is a basically like the perfect use case for waking up and slamming a shake with some sort of carb powder like dextrose and uh, a, whey, a whey protein supplement. Like you could put some whey protein in the same shake. That way you have at least some pre-workout nutrition and uh, still focus on hydration. You should be drinking water, you know, probably all the way up to the point where you're getting to the gym. But it's definitely not one or the other. You can definitely eat your the rest of your quote unquote real food later in the day, but it would still be a good idea to get some whey protein and to get a carb powder of some sort in you before you actually train as that should help performance and uh, prevent muscle loss. If you had a severely lacking brachialis or muscle, what would be your go-to movements? So first of all, let's just call this out because it has to be called out. There's a 99.9% .9 chance that that's completely all in your head. Like whenever people name like a super specific muscle that's part of a larger muscle group and go, this is for sure lagging. I'm just like immediate detector goes off in my head. But if you want to train the brachialis, the best movement to do that is going to be hammer curls. If you're talking about the brachioradialis in the forearm, that's going to be reverse curls. So, you know, keep in mind also that every curl variation is going to hit all three of those to some extent. It's just that the position of your hand is going to change the bias. If you're doing any kind of rows or pull downs with, you know, a pronated grip or a neutral grip, you're going to hit those muscles as well. That's why most curling should be done with supination. Can you explain the benefits of adding weight to the assisted pull-up or dip machine? It basically just acts like a Smith machine for pull-ups and dips. So all the same benefits that you would get from using the Smith machine to do a barbell press versus using an actual barbell, you're on a fixed track. There's less stability demands. This is particularly noticeable in pull-ups because that weight that you add for pull-ups is usually a small percentage of the total system. So like if you're lifting, if you're 200 pounds and you're doing body weight pull-ups and you add a 25 pound plate, the weight added is like 10% of the system versus like it's very common for people to squat, double to triple their body weight for reps. But with pull-ups, you can get a lot of that back and forth swaying from your torso. And when you do it with your feet stabilized on an assisted pull-up machine, you get rid of that and it just makes the movement more stable. And a more stable movement pattern means the prime movers can work harder. Now granted, pull-ups are plenty stable if you've been doing them long enough as well. So it's just a variation in the end. How to deal with well-meaning form police, but you're stronger than them and you're just doing what your coach told you to do. So I'm gonna assume that you actually like this particular form policeman. And, and that's why you're bothering to care how you respond at all. Because personally, like, I think the best response to stuff like that is usually just to ignore it. Because even if you try to give, like, a civilized response, a lot of times people want to, like, rebut you. And they'll be like, well, do you, do you know that Dan Green said that you're doing it wrong? Do you know that Joey Flex said you're doing it wrong? So just say thanks, but I'm doing what my coach told me. And if they respond again, ignore. What is your good morning ratio compared to squat and deadlift. I do not train good mornings, especially not free weight. I have done machine good mornings a couple of times since starting bodybuilding training, but I have not done a free weight good morning uh, probably since 2015, which is what, like eight years ago at this point. 
Uh, the last time I did good mornings regularly in my program, I was still powerlifting and I was new to powerlifting and I was doing the conjugate method. So that's how long ago that was. Um, yeah, I, I don't train good mornings. I don't like them. What ab exercises do you recommend? So the primary function of the abs is going to be spinal flexion. So crunch variations and sit-up variations are going to be the main thing you care about. I like machine crunches because they're incrementally loadable and weak people can do them. Um, the problem with sit-ups and decline sit-ups for me as an enhanced lifter is that they involve a bit of anti-rotation, which has the potential to hypertrophy your obliques. If you are natural, that might not matter as much. You probably have to go crazy to get a lot of oblique, oblique development from decline setups. The other thing that the abs do is they assist in hip flexion. So something like a hanging leg raise plus crunches and setups is all you really need. Should we be worried about long-term damage from blasting music through our headphones in the gym? Well, um, you could just turn it down, right? <laughs> but honestly, I think most devices like have actual sound control built in so that you can't exceed certain decibel levels. But again, I mean, it's not like you're going to a concert and you have like no control over how loud the music is going to be. So you have to put in earplugs like you own the device and you can just click the little volume button and put it to a more reasonable level at any point. Thoughts on Tonkat Ali. Is it a worthwhile supplement to buy? No, man. That, that it is a glorified dick pill ingredient. It doesn't do anything to help build muscle. It doesn't do anything for endurance. It's not going to help with fat loss. Uh, no. And here's the thing about supplements being worth it in general, right? Like for a monthly supply of Tonka Ollie, you could probably buy four months of liquid Cialis from any peptide or, or research chemical site. It's never worth it. Do dead hangs really offer any benefits? So for one, they're a stretch. They can stretch your biceps, your lats, or whatever is tight in the shoulder gurgle complex and limits your ability to get your arms directly overhead. Two, they can offer some sort of spinal decompression. And there are countless anecdotes from sports people, from all sports, that will tell you and claim that dead hangs help improve back discomfort and back pain. Uh, as far as anything beyond that on a clinical level, I don't know and I don't think so, but they do have those anecdotes going for them. Any tips for Ramadan? Number one, you're going to want to become nocturnal like Batman. Uh, no. Okay. Well, if you can't do that, you should at least uh, try to train after sunset. That way you can have some sort of hydration and nutrition going into the workout. Again, just like the other guy earlier today. It's a perfect time to use supplements. You know, as soon as the sun goes down, slam down a whey protein shake with some carb powder, start drinking water, get yourself hydrated, and uh, get to the gym while you have some nutrition in you. And then before you go to sleep, eat a big meal. Uh, from there, I would just recommend maintenance calories and maintenance volumes until it's over. Does a static stretching can cause hypertrophy? It does can indeed. And does can is the key phrase because not all studies which measure static stretching and then hypertrophy outcomes get hypertrophy outcomes. Some do, some don't. So it may be related to the absolute time spent in the stretch. It may be related to the intensity of the stretch. It may be related to whether or not additional weight is added. It may be related to only specific muscles benefit from stretch mediated hypertrophy. On an anecdotal level, uh, in DC training, dog training the extreme stretches are done in the 60 to 90 second range for as much weight as possible and many people have seen gains from doing that all right everybody if you like the video like the video any comments questions leave them below subscribe if you haven't already and have a wonderful day bit of a short one today but the good news there is that means i can actually upload it in full quality without my phone freaking out so 1080p it is